Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. EQA Nostalgia here, and I just got done watching the interview with Boogie2988 and Brad McQuaid. It was a great interview, and there was a lot of information, and there was a very heartfelt interview. We got to know Brad a little bit better. And what I mean by that is we got to know him a little bit better as a person, and I think that's really important. It really helps the community bind to what you're trying to do when they can recognize you as a human being, and not just a faceless developer. So that was very awesome. We also got a lot of pretty good information that I don't think was released before, and if it had been released, I hadn't heard it. And Boogie asked a few tough questions, and that was another thing that made it very interesting. And I want to thank Brad for taking the time to speak with one of the fans. I think that was really awesome of him. And I want to thank Boogie2988 as well because he has a huge audience. And that reached a lot of people. And it most definitely helped the Kickstarter. So thank you, Brad. And thank you, Boogie. I know Boogie most likely will not see this video because I am a very, very small voice here on YouTube. I'm pretty much unknown. So if he sees this, that would be awesome. But I highly doubt that's going to happen. Now this video is not going to be short, not by any means. I typically try to keep it short because I know people don't like to watch long videos and they, and they don't get past a certain point, but there are a lot of things I want to talk about. First of all, if you have not seen that interview, I suggest you click on the link I've provided on your screen and check that out before you continue with this video. And naturally when you do that, this video will be paused and you can come right back to it as soon as you're done. The first thing I want to talk about actually has nothing to do with that video, and it's about the community that sprung up around this game. It just goes to show that people are dying for an old school, community driven MMORPG. We actually had a fan site pop up, like the same day as the Kickstarter, it might have been before that, but I got an invite to PJ Pantheon very quickly, <laughs> like I think it was the same day as the Kickstarter. And those guys actually contacted me on Facebook and sent me an invite on Facebook so people were dedicated to this as soon as they heard about it. I highly recommend you check out that site PJ Pantheon. I'm going to link it in the description just like I do all my Pantheon videos. There are some great people over there and the site is growing immensely every day. And I've also noticed over there on the official Kickstarter page there are 8,095 comments right now currently. There will be more obviously before I finish this video and I just backed the project just now and I could only back it at $25 I mean I don't have a lot of money I gotta be honest with you guys so I only put down $25 for now I might be able to bump it up later I'm not certain but I'm not gonna put anything down that I'm not positive that I can actually back so as soon as I got in there and I said hi to everybody there there was instantly like 50 people saying hey welcome welcome and it's just everybody there is really cool and they're extremely dedicated, passionate people, and it's really, really nice to see that. I haven't seen that in a long time. At least in terms of MMORPGs, I have seen that with HR Worlds Elite on the Kickstarter page. Those guys were very passionate, and as many of you know, I am very passionate about that game. So yes, it's, it's just a breath of fresh air to see that the community is, is coming together, and they're really looking forward to this. And I know why they're looking forward to this, because we don't have anything like this anymore. It just doesn't exist. And in the market nowadays, it's just so fast-paced that nobody really talks, gets to know each other. Most of the communities are highly toxic. You know, like, I hate to pick on World of Warcraft, but it's, it's kind of like the biggest MMORPG, like, ever. And the community is, it's, it's just, it sucks, you know? And Boogie had a really good point in his video when he said that World of Warcraft is a great game, but it's not... A community it's not like an experience like you're really involved with the world it's just a game you're playing a game you're not in uh, completely immersed in the world and he nailed it right there and, and, I, and I don't really think about that that much I always knew that there was more of a social aspect to games like that but I don't know for some reason that just resonated with me because it, it's so true <laughs> people don't talk you know it's just a game and that's not to say that there aren't guilds that are dedicated and that they're really loyal to one another, but the game itself, it's not an immersive experience, and, and the community really doesn't drive it. The game drives the game, and people play the game. It's not the community driving the game, and that's the difference. And most MMORPGs are like that now. They're just games that people play. And a lot of people might be thinking, well, Ever EverQuest was just a game. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. And EverQuest Online Adventures wasn't just a game. It was a living, breathing community. There were a lot of friends being made there. I met my wife on EverQuest Online Adventures. It, it was deep. It was a world. And the community really relied on one another. And people actually talked. 
You made friends with people. Because it wasn't so fast-paced that you didn't have time to type. And that's one of the things that Boogie mentioned. And he asked Brad, he's, he asked if there was going to be any downtime in the game. And he said, you know, nothing like crazy 45-minute downtimes <laughs> waiting for spawns. I don't, you know, I don't really miss that. But what I do miss is just camping with friends and waiting for, you know, maybe 30, 40 seconds for a spawn to come back. Or a, a few minutes. I don't think Brad is interested in having an hour-long spawn timer on a dragon. I don't know, he might be, but it, it's seen by the way he was talking that that's not what they're going for, but they do plan on having downtime, so I thought it was nice that they mentioned that. And I've been subscribed to Boogie for a while now, I enjoy his videos, and I had no idea that he was an EverQuest fan. I didn't know that. You know, He started talking about how it changed his life, and it, it, that's the case for me, that's the case for a lot of people who played EverQuest and EverQuest Online Adventures, even EverQuest 2. As much as I don't really care for that game that much, I know there's probably people out there who are like, you bastard! But I just, it, it just didn't feel the same to me as EverQuest Online Adventures. And for those of you who don't know me, I just want to let you know that I started with EQOA, and yes, it was a PlayStation 2 game. And I know a lot of people on PC are probably shaking their heads right now, but it was very immersive and it was a very, very good game. And it was very similar to the original EverQuest. And another thing they mentioned was that there were guides that would take people from town to town. And I could relate to that. I haven't really played EverQuest 1 a lot, and I certainly didn't start with it. I started with the EQOA. But I can relate to that because I remember people running me from place to place. You know, nobody charged me for it, thankfully. They were cool enough to run me. And we had this thing called coaches in EverQuest. You would sign the ledger, and then you could just kind of teleport there. So it wasn't as hardcore as what the original EverQuest fans were used to. At least, you know, until Planes of Power came out and then everybody was teleporting everywhere. But anyway, um, it was kind of like that. But we had a coaching system. And you couldn't coach there until you signed the ledger. And it was really hard to get around, man. If you were a newbie and you were just starting out, and let's say you started in Kinos, and you wanted to make your way to Freeport because you wanted to kill Crocs and you wanted to kill Desert Mad Men and stuff like that, you needed someone to take you there. And if you tried on your own, you probably weren't going to make it. Unless you had invisibility, and it always helped to have Spirit of the Wolf. And another thing you mentioned is that there were no maps in EverQuest 1. We didn't have a map either, we had a compass. You know, there was no map. If you wanted a map, you had to print it up on Alakazam. And it was pretty hardcore. I mean, it wasn't as hardcore as the original EverQuest, but it was pretty hardcore. When you died, you didn't have to do corpse runs. You got into debt. But, but do not mistake that for easy, because debt sucked. I mean, I remember plenty of times having to having to get out of debt in EverQuest Online Adventures. It took hours. Sometimes it took hours. Depending on your level, it got steeper and steeper. And sometimes you died a lot. It was very dangerous. And there was a sense of danger in the game at all times. You never felt safe. And, you know, they were very similar games, but obviously EverQuest, the original EverQuest was more hardcore. So I can totally relate to a lot of the things they were saying about EverQuest and how hardcore it was and how that actually created a great community. People would bind together and they would get together and help each other. I definitely want to see that with Pantheon Rise of the Fallen. I want to see that community driven game. I think I want that more than anything else. And for the longest time I was playing games and I just I was playing MMORPGs and I just couldn't place my finger on it. I'm like this world is beautiful. It's big. There's a lot to explore but it just doesn't hold my attention. There's something wrong. And I just kind of deduced that nothing can replace your first MMORPG. It's always going to be special. That might be true, but what I think it is, is that it's just not exciting. There's no there's no risk. And when you have risk versus reward, and the risk is steep and the reward is great, that that's something that I think is missing in a lot of MMORPGs. There's this instant gratification stuff that's going on, and I can't stand that. I really don't like it. I like having to work towards a goal. And, and I've heard people say MMORPGs aren't supposed to be fun, they're supposed to be work. I don't necessarily agree with that wholeheartedly. I do think that they are supposed to be something that you have to work at, and I don't think that they're supposed to be casual, you know, casual fun games where you log in for a couple of hours and you get all the reward you, you wanted. I do think there's, there should be time investment there, and I think it should be hard. But it should still be fun if you're not having fun, what are you playing it for? I had a lot of fun with EverQuest Island Adventures. There were moments of frustration, like when I wiped over and over and over, and then I had to spend, you know, two, three days getting out of debt. 
you know, half my experience was going towards that. That sucked, but, you know, it, it just made for more exciting gameplay. You were more careful. You didn't just zerg into things and, you know, if I die, whatever. I just got to repair my gear and start over at the graveyard. It wasn't like that. You were scared to die. Now, when Boogie mentioned that corpse running was like a community event and people got together and it created bonds, I, I was, I gotta admit, I never really thought of it like that. Because I come from EQOA, we didn't have to do that, but that seems like something that I kind of missed out on now that I'm thinking about it. But then at the same time, when you would get into debt in EverQuest Online Adventures, people came together to try to get you out of debt. You know, I remember several times saying to my guild, oh man, I am so deep in debt, I'm never going to get to end cap now, and I just want to start a new tune. And people were like, hey man, we'll get you out of the debt. You know, we'll go kill Knowles for like two hours, <laughs> or Kobolds, or something like that. And, you know, people did get together, and they did help you out of debt. So that was the social aspect as well. But yeah, we didn't have corpse running, and I don't know, a part of me kind of wishes that we did. And that's one of those subjects where the community is kind of divided on that. A lot of people are like, no, 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 I don't want to do that, you know, I got great memories, but dude, I don't want to do that anymore, I am like 10 years, 15 years older, and I just don't have the patience for that shit anymore, I don't want to do that. And then there's people that are, you know, the opposite, like, I loved that, and I, and I miss it, and I want it to come back. Now, when Boogie asked him what he wanted to do, he said he wanted he might want to have corpse runs. He wasn't very specific, like he wasn't certain, but he said that if he does have something like that, he doesn't want it to be as strict. Brad said that he wasn't very interested in seeing people's corpses melting away with, with all their gear and everything going away in eight hours or anything that strict. So we're not too certain on how that's going to play out or what sort of death penalties we are going to see. Now, he did acknowledge that his fan base, the fans that are rallied around Pantheon, they are accustomed to that, and he knows that that's something that they're looking for. So that might be a hint that we will have corpse runs. I don't think it's safe to say either way just yet. But what do you guys think? I mean, I think it would be cool to have corpse runs as long as your stuff doesn't go away, like, ever. It just sits there until you retrieve it. And maybe, it, you know, maybe some spells that can help you. I don't know. I don't know. I, I wasn't part of that, so I really can't. I can't say uh, with certainty how I'd like it to go. One thing that I remember reading about is people having their corpses fall into places that they couldn't reach. So, I guess later on they implemented uh, the ability to drag your corpse to the edge of the zone. That would be pretty cool. You know, having to at least get to the zone and then you could you corpse drag, and that would be something that I think you'd be interested in. So, let me know what you guys think about the death penalty in the game. Leave a comment down below. I love reading that sort of stuff. I, I read everything people say, trust me. So yeah, definitely let me know. Okay, so becoming server famous, that was something that Boogie had mentioned. They didn't really talk about that that much, but I think that's something that doesn't really happen anymore. Back in those days, communities seemed to be a lot smaller than they are now, because, let's face it, MMORPG, the genre has gotten pretty big. There's a lot of people that play World of Warcraft and stuff like that, so it's a lot harder to become server famous. So yeah, I think that's kind of a sign of the times. I don't think you're really going to see too much of that, even in Pantheon. I think what it is now is it's all about the guilds and not so much the individual who, you know, who, who makes a name for himself. It's more about the guild who took down a raid encounter and now everybody knows who they are. So I think it's more about guilds than it is the individual. Okay, so the next thing they mentioned was about the economy and how they're going to handle trading and, and stuff like that. Are they going to have auctions or... Are people going to actually get together? And I wasn't a part of EverQuest 1. You know, I played it. I did a, a noob, a noob's journey through North, I called it. They're like little Let's Plays that I had with my wife, where her and I went through and played the game. So check those out if you haven't. But I did that for a little while, and I remember coming across the East Commonlands Tunnel, and I knew about it for a while. How can you play an EverQuest game and not have somebody tell you about that? I heard about all the legendary stuff like that. So I went there, and it was like going to like a historic place for her and I. We went there, and we're like, man, this is the tunnel, man. This is where everybody used to go to trade. This is so awesome. But there was like this aura of sadness as soon as we went in there. Because there was one person sitting there. She was a dark elf, and she wasn't AFK. She was just sitting there, and she said hi and everything. And we were like, is this like the, the tunnel, the legendary tunnel? And she's like, oh, yeah, this is where everybody used to come. It's just empty now, and it was really sad. And auction houses, 
they take away from that kind of community bonding and I don't know I don't know how I feel about it because on one hand it's convenient if you want to get something it's there just open up the auction house and boom you get whatever you want and something like that was kind of similar with EverQuest where people used to go to trade I think we went to Freeport to trade mostly if you wanted to trade you went there or you went to like high pass and people would be trading there we didn't have a tunnel or anything like that but it did take away from that sense of <clears throat> excuse me it did take away from that sense of community involvement and, and bonding and that just kinda sucks and one thing in EverQuest Island Adventures that they did do was they took away our the ability for us to seek out a group they added a looking for group system and it was nice because it was quick and convenient but at the same time you know back in the day on, on EQOA when it first came out if you were like level 10, if you were like from like level 1 to level 10, you could go to Freeport and shout for a group. And you could get a group at Crocs or Mad Men and stuff like that. And then once you got up to like 15 or 20, I can't remember the specifics, you would go to a place called Darver Manor. Now that wasn't in the original EverQuest. And once you went there, you'd go to Bandits. And then after that, you'd go to High Pass. You guys called it High Keep. And I say you guys because I know there's going to be a lot of original EverQuest fans watching this. You guys called it high keep, we called it high pass, same place, same thing. And then we'd get groups there, fighting highwaymen and stuff like that. And, you know, when they when they implemented that looking for group system, it just tore that apart. I remember going to Darver Manor and no one was there anymore. Because nobody cared. Nobody, There was no reason to be there anymore. So it just did not matter. And it, and it tore away a part of the community and, and it just sucked. And it's got to be hard on Brad because he's probably thinking, well, I want people to have those old school feelings and I want that sense of community tightness. I want people to be able to shout for a group or I want them to be able to create their own player driven content where they, you know, they create another East Common Lands Tunnel. But at the same time, I don't want to drive away people that might not like that because if you're not into that sort of thing and you come into Pantheon, that's going to turn you off right away. You're going to be like, what the hell? I gotta get my corpse. There's no looking for group list here. I gotta shout for it. Not everybody likes that sort of thing. And, you know, I know most of you guys are probably thinking, well, if they don't like that, they don't have to play this game and go play World of Warcraft. But you have to remember there's a lot of people that were into EverQuest 1 that might not be into that anymore. We've kind of been spoiled. You know what I mean? And people kind of tend to look for that path of least resistance. And now that it's there, playing a game that doesn't have that in it, that might not be the wisest decision. It could it could end up in, with not so many people playing the game. So it's a tough decision that he has to make. And I don't envy him for that reason. Because there's a lot of things that he's got to get right to please the old school fans. But at the same time, he can't make a game that's too old school and too hardcore. Because it'll just push people away. And you do want new blood to come into the game. Sure, there's a lot of hardcore MMO fans. But... I don't know how many of us are left that can sustain the game. So, yeah, that's just my thought on that. It, it is nice to see that, though. And I would, if it was left up to me, I would definitely leave it the way it was in the old days. I would definitely let people create their own little bizarre area where they gather and they trade goods and no looking for group and none of that stuff. Certainly no raid finder or any crap like that. Now, Brett did mention something, and I thought it was very, very cool having like a local auction hall in each city or each town that isn't connected to one another so you can't just you know magically open it up and it's connected everywhere so that does keep people in certain areas and I like that idea I think it's really cool and now it definitely beats the idea of what EverQuest 1 is doing right now where each individual character is standing on a little platform and you go to their AFK character who's selling stuff and it's kind of like an auction hall, but it's not. It's like a hybrid. <laughs> That's just a pain in the ass. You know, if you're going to do it, just just go ahead and put an auction hall. You know, you know what I mean? That's just more of a pain in the ass than anything. So having a place where you could go within that specific city, I think that'll actually create people who huddle around. And they might actually try to sell things in that city instead of putting them up on the auction hall because maybe they'll sell quicker. Because people still do that. It's just not as often. I even see that in World of Warcraft all the time. People shout that they're selling stuff. 
And my my response usually to that is, "Hey, dude, just put it up on the auction." What are you, what are you doing? It's, it's it, things go very quickly. But yeah, I think I like that idea. What do you guys think about that? I think it's pretty clever. I really do. And I never thought about it. You know what I mean? It's just I'm not a game developer. I don't sit there and I don't brainstorm like these guys do. But I think that's a very good solution. So, I mean, you guys might be of the mind to just leave it the old school way where people can gather. Or maybe you're just like, you know, just connect everything. But yeah, let me know what you think about that. Now, Brad also mentioned that there will be a tutorial of sorts, but he doesn't want it to be like your own isolated tutorial where you're not really a part of the world. Another thing he said is that during this learning phase, the first few levels of the game will be free. And then after that, you can choose whether or not you want to subscribe to the game. And I think that's a pretty good idea. So there's going to be a little bit of hand-holding in the beginning just to kind of set you up and let you learn a little bit of what's going on around you, but nothing too crazy. It's, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to hold your hand the whole way through the game. You're going to have some pop-ups and things like that that kind of guide you along to let you learn what it is you're supposed to be doing, and then you're going to be left to your own devices with a big, huge world in front of you which is pretty much what all of us want. So after the first few levels when you learn and you start to subscribe to the game, that's when you're on your own. Okay, so there's basically just one more thing I want to discuss here. And that was when Boogie asked Brad about Vanguard. And as soon as he did that, I was just sitting there thinking, oh, oh man, that's, that's a tough question, you know? How do you, how do you respond to that? Because there's a lot of people who kind of look down on Vanguard because well, it didn't really have a wonderful start, but in my opinion, it's a great game to this day. And it's a shame, it is getting shut down in case you didn't know. I mentioned that in one of the videos I released yesterday. It is going to be shut down, and that's a shame. But it was a very hard-hitting question. So when I heard that, I was I was just like kind of sitting at the edge of my seat, wondering what, what Brad was going to say. And I think he handled it very well, and he showed himself to be very humble. And I earned a lot of respect for him. I already had a lot of respect for Brad, but I earned even more respect for him by the way he handled that situation and how humble he was. And when he was talking about how tough that was, I don't think a lot of people understand what goes into game development and how hard it is. Because if something fails, like nobody makes a game, right? They don't set out to make a game for failure. They don't, they don't have failure on their mind. Whenever a game comes out and it's not any good, <laughs> it's not like the developers are sitting around in a circle saying, yeah, let's troll these people and release a shitty game. That's not the way it is. Things just happen to go wrong. And, you know, I'm not going to discuss everything that was said in the video because you guys really do need to watch that video if you haven't already. But, yeah, it, it was just, you know, it, it was a mess. I mean, there wasn't a lot of funding for Vanguard. You know, Brad said a lot of people had to be let go, and he knew that before they had to be let go, like a month or two in advance, he said. That's got to be really hard, you know what I mean? you got to look these people in the eye, and you know that you have to you have to cut the team in half. 50% of the team had to go. And that's the kind of shit right there that makes a man lose sleep, and it stresses him out. And that's just really, you know, I mean, th th that was a nightmare situation, and he did the best he could to correct that. And I've seen a lot of people, when I post my videos on Reddit, especially Reddit, for some reason people can be really cruel on Reddit. Most of the forums where I post things, people are cool. But on Reddit, <laughs> I don't want to bash Reddit, but for some reason there's just some really unsavory individuals on Reddit that say some very nasty things, and they've said some very nasty things about Brad. And I always defend him, and I ask people, what have you done with your life? And I don't want to turn this into a rant, but when it comes down to it, when people do that, they're not looking at themselves. Were they a part of EverQuest? Did they help build a cultural phenomenon? No. So, you know, this guy has one failing, and everybody, well not everybody, but certain individuals are, are willing to point their finger and say, well, he failed here, why should I trust him here? Well, don't look at the massive success that was EverQuest. Don't look at that. Look at the failings. And there's something about the human condition where they're much quicker to point out your failings than they are to applaud your accomplishments and that's just something that I think is part of the human psyche but yeah you know I mean I've been around on forums I've been on reddit and I'm trying to get people to rally and get behind this I really am I spent a lot of time doing that 
And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I'm telling people that I have. I've spent a lot of time trying to get people on board with this game. Because I believe in this game, and I believe what Brad is doing. And when I do that, you know, when you do stuff like that, you're bound to come across people who are negative. And I really hope those negative individuals see this interview so they understand what went wrong there. And like I said, Vanguard is a great game. In my opinion, it's a great game. And I'm going to start playing it again before it gets shut down because there's, you know, I didn't really play much of it. But what I did play of it, I enjoyed. And there is a passionate and dedicated community there for Vanguard. Like when Buki said that people were kind of getting mad at him because he said that, it, you know, it had failed. And there's people saying, wait a minute, this was a great game. And they're absolutely right. I mean, the community is not huge. Obviously, it's not a massive community. But the people that are there are dedicated. So naturally, I think it's a shame that it's being shut down. But I, I really think it was awesome that we got to learn that little bit of information from Brad during that interview. And that was probably my favorite part of the interview. So that's pretty much all I had to say, guys. I just, you know, I wanted to get that out there. I thought it was a great interview. And I want to know what you guys think. I'm interested to know what you guys think about the death penalty in the game, how that should be. Don't forget, I did ask that question. And I also want to know what you guys think about the auction hall system. Now, if this is your first time to my channel and you like what you see, make sure you hit the subscribe button because I will be covering this topic. I've said that in every video I've done so far for this, but I know guys are probably getting sick of hearing that. But yes, I will be covering this extensively. I thank every one of you for watching and I look forward to seeing you all in my next video.